So um, I'm a PhD student at Stanford working with uh, Leif Thomas and today I'm going to tell you about um, my work looking at how tropical instability waves influence small-scale um, turbulence in the upper equatorial Pacific. Um, so this work is mainly motivated by a couple of recent sets of observations of this phenomena which I'll briefly highlight in the first section. Um, and then in the second section I'll talk about how I'm using an ocean model to look at what the large-scale dynamics driving that modulation is. In particular, we'll see how tropical instability waves are able to um, modify the equatorial undercurrent shear. Um, in the third section, I'll kind of look at the implications of this, uh, in particular look at how, what the total influence of tropical instability waves is on the turbulent heat flux, with obvious implications for the equatorial SST budget in the Pacific. Uh, and then I'll summarize at the end. So the first set of observations I want to highlight um, is due to Renche Len in a GRL paper in 2008. Um, it's basically a combination of some Lagrangian observations with a bunch of modeling work. Um, so on the top left here, we're showing an SST image in the equatorial Pacific. Um, you can see we've got, so this is the, the track of their Lagrangian um, float that they followed around in the ship. Um, and you can see we have some energetic tropical instability waves here. In particular, we have about three cold cusps or cold phases, which I'll refer to them. Um, and also two maybe warm troughs or warm phases here. So here's some results from their model. What I'm plotting here is the reduced shear squared. So this is kind of like the Richardson number. It just expresses the balance between shear, which is trying to destabilize um, the flow to shear instability and the stabilizing stratification. So in particular, when you have higher values of reduced shear squared, you'd expect more turbulence and lower values, you'd expect less. So on the bottom panel here, we're looking latitude and longitude. Um, to orientate you, we've got um, the black and the red isotherms, one from the model, one from the observations, showing where the cold and the warm phases are, which are also highlighted here. And what you'll notice is that, in particular, going from the cold to the warm phase, we get these patches of high reduced shear squared, and that's patches of high equatorial turbulence. Now, with their float, they were able to absorb the kind of implications of this. So, in particular, the entrainment heat flux at the base of the mixed layer. And so, Obviously, the, the color here is from their model, but if you look at the observations, which is taken along this Lagrangian float track, what you see is this strong modulation in the turbulent heat flux. So it's changing by quite a bit here, and so this could potentially have big implications for the equatorial SST budget. Um, the second set, set of observations, I'm not going to show a figure here, just want to highlight this anyway. Um, paper from 2012 in JGR. Um, these guys basically sat at 140 degrees west, zero north in the equatorial Pacific. Um, and they were doing microstructure turbulence profiling, two-week time series, so around about a whole TRW period. Um, and they basically observed that the lowest Richardson numbers and the highest turbulent kinetic energy dissipation rates um, were in the same phase, the cold to warm phase. So these observations kind of raised two questions. Um, firstly, what are the large-scale dynamics driving this modulation? And secondly, what's the implications? What is the influence of this modulation on the equatorial SST budget? So I'm going to use some modeling work to kind of address these two questions. So firstly, what are the large-scale dynamics driving the modulation? So here's a, just um, to introduce you to my simulations. It's just a nested set of regional ocean modeling simulations of the equatorial Pacific. We have a quarter degree outer, outer nest with 50 vertical levels. It's uh, forced using core NYF forcing. And then inside, I've nested two higher resolution domains, 20th and a 40th of a degree. And this is in order to do accurate Lagrangian analyses, which I'll show you in a second. And obviously, the subject of the talk is on vertical mixing. I'm using KPP for the vertical mixing parameterization, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in the second part of the talk. OK, so here's an animation from the simulations. So we're looking, in color, we're looking at the reduced shear squared. Um, the arrows are horizontal velocity, all at 70 meters depth. And then we also got contours here, which are a little harder to see, which show the SST. And so what you can see is, in my simulations, I get that similar um, modulation of the reduced shear squared here. We have, for example, there we have three patches, and it's in the same kind of phase as we'd expect from the observation. So the simulations seem to be getting this right. So uh, one obvious first question we might ask is, okay, we see that the reduced shear squared is modulated. Which of its component, component terms is responsible for that modulation? Is it zonal, meridional shear, or the stratification? So here we're looking at an um, equatorial slice, so west, east here across the equator. You can see the shoaling thermocline and the temperature here, and you can see a couple of phases, warm and cold phases of tropical instability waves. Then I'm showing the stratification, the zonal shear, the meridional shear, and finally the, the reduced shear squared. So you can see three specific patches of high reduced shear squared. We would infer high mixing there. Um, and if we look at 
which term is responsible for those, it looks like the most obvious term that's well correlated with it is the zonal shear. And so this is, at least for the high patches of mixing, we conclude that modulations in reduced shear squared are generally driven by variations in the equatorial undercurrent zonal shear, as opposed to, the, for example, the meridional shear of the tropical instability waves. So why are tropical instability waves altering the equatorial undercurrent shear? To answer that question, I did some Lagrangian vorticity dynamics calculations. So basically, I took a bunch of Lagrangian floats and seeded them inside one of these patches of high mixing and then ran the advection backwards in time. So we're looking at three slices in time um, separated by six days. And so if you follow the, the particles back, you see that about 90% of them come from the equatorial undercurrent. That makes sense. We're in the equatorial undercurrent. But there's a small proportion that come from a nearby tropical instability vortex. So now we're looking at basically the ensembled average of certain fields along these Lagrangian floats. So the final time here it corresponds to this panel here. So if we focus on the green line here, which is the reduced shear squared, you can see this very distinct increase in the reduced shear squared in the last couple of days here, corresponding to when we enter that patch. And if you look at the different component terms, well, just like we saw before, it's mainly an increase in zonal shear that's responsible. The meridional shear is small, the stratification is constant. So why is the zonal shear change? We can do a Lagrangian budget of zonal shear along these fluid parcel tracks. So the zonal shear can change due to baroclinic torque, vortex stretching, frictional torques, or vortex tilting. So if you plot these terms, we time integrate them and plot them along this track. Firstly, the black is the zonal shear, so we see that increase in magnitude. If you look at the different terms, you can see that the one responsible for the increase is the vortex stretching term. So what this is telling us is that patches of high reduced shear squared are resulting from tropical instability wave meridional divergence, DVDY, or tropical instability wave strain, um, that act to increase the equatorial undercurrent shear through horizontal vortex stretching. So I summarize that in this one equation here. And so on the right here, I'm showing a schematic of how this is happening. So we've got an equatorial slice, um, and then we've got a horizontal slice. And what we can see is that, for example, in this first squashing phase, do you have another one of these? Or? No, it's okay. Um, in this first squashing phase here, we have flow, tropical instability wave flow towards the equator. This results in vortex squashing, decreases the shear, and we get less turbulence. In the opposite phase, we get flow away from the equator. This results in vortex stretching, which spins up that shear and results in higher turbulence. Okay, so now onto the second part. What, you, what we really want to know here is what the average effect on the turbulence is. So, if, for example, if we sum up all of these... Um, all of these phases, do we overall get an increase or a decrease in the mixing? Um, so to kind of take a first pass at this question, um, I've basically included the effects of this tropical instability wave strain in a very simple mixing model um, of the equatorial undercurrent. So we can re represent this tropical instability wave strain force, so the meridional divergence here. We're just going to model it as an ideal sinusoidal oscillation. And we can include it in a 1D diffusion model as a zonal body force. So it's a very simple set of equations. We have the zonal momentum equation. We have the tropical instability wave forcing here. We have the pressure gradient force, just a large-scale pressure gradient force that maintains the equatorial undercurrent against the action of vertical mixing here. We also have a temperature and a salinity equation, which I'm not showing. And that's simply a Newtonian restoring, balancing a vertical mixing. So it's obviously very important how we parameterize these vertical mixing terms. Um, so what I'm going to do is compare the results from two different parameterizations. So they're very simple parameterizations. We have just your sign of diffusivity depending on what value of Richardson number you measure. Um, we're going to compare the results from KPP, which is what I'm using in my 3D model, and that's these solid lines here, and the Pakanowski and Philander interior parameterization, which is the dashed lines. And so you can see they have a very different form, which has um, large implications. So here's some results from the mixing model. On the left, we're showing results from the KPP simulation. On the right, from the Pekinowski and Flanders simulation. The top term here is my sinusoidally oscillating tropical instability wave strain. So if you see in this initial phase, we have meridional divergence or difluence. Um, this drives vortex stretching, which increases our zonal shear here. This lowers the Richardson number or increases the inverse Richardson number. The mixing schemes then assign a um, high diffusivity, and we result in a high turbulent heat flux. Now, there's some important differences between KPP and Pakanowski and Philander. The one that maybe is most obvious here is that Pakanowski and Philander um, gives you, doesn't give you as lower Richardson numbers. But what we really want to focus on here is the turbulent heat flux. So what happens if we now average this turbulent heat flux over a tropical instability wave phase? So that's what I'm showing on the left here. So the black solid curve here is averaging the tropical instability wave heat flux in the KPP simulation over a TLW period. And then the dashed line, 
Thank you. The dashed line is doing the same simulation. That's way better. Um, but turning off the tropical instability waves. So I set the, the TIW strain to zero. And then the blue curve solid is with TIWs, dashed is without TIWs. And so what you can see is when you add that TIW strain, you actually get an increase in the turbulent heat flux. This is a rectifying effect. If we average between 50 and 100 meters, we can see for KPP we get about a 2% increase, for Pakanowski and Flander we get a 30% increase. So there's two questions raised here. Firstly, why does this rectification effect depend on the mixing scheme? And secondly, why is it an increase? Why have we increased the, the heat flux by adding tropical instability waves? So the first question um, turns out basically to depend on the functional form of the diffusivity curve. So you can actually defy, de, um, derive the, or approximate the effect of this rectification um, effect by doing a Taylor series expansion, and you find that it depends on the curvature of the diffusivity curve. So this has profound implications because if you, if you plot the diffusivity, for example, as a function of the zonal shear at some constant n squared, what you see is that the, the two mixing schemes that I'm using have opposite sign curvatures. So KPP has a negative curvature, Pakanowski and Philander has a positive curvature here. And so they have opposite sign rectification effects. And that's what's responsible for the fact that Pakanowski and Philander has a larger rectification than KPP. Secondly, why is there an increase in the, in the first place? Well, that turns out to be um, just a, a function of the dynamics, the large scale dynamics that are driving this. So here I'm showing this horizontal vortex stretching equation you can see that the, how much increase in zonal shear we get depends on the zonal shear itself. And so I'm calling it nonlinear, which might, might not be appropriate, but yeah. Um, so if I replace that zonal shear on the right here with a mean zonal shear, then I remove that nonlinearity. And if we run simulations with this linear forcing instead of this nonlinear forcing, we can see that rectified increase disappears. We now get a rectified decrease. And so this nonlinear nature of vortex stretching, the large scale dynamics that's driving this modulation, is critical to the fact that we get an increase in the, in the heat fluxes. Okay, so finally to summarize, we've seen that periodic tropical instability wave strain, so this meridional diffluence, can modulate equatorial undercurrent zonal shear through horizontal vortex stretching. And this modulates the reduced shear squared and thus the turbulent heat flux. Um, in the context of this quite simple 1D mixing model, we've seen that tropical instability waves can drive an increase of that heat flux of up to 30%. But that increase is very sensitive to the mixing scheme. In particular, it's the curvature of this Kappa-Richardson number curve, which is critical. And so you can see that this has potential large implications for the equatorial SST budget and different ocean models, um, and in particular, the role of tropical instability waves in that modulating that vertical mixing term. Thank you. Yeah. But something I realize is you never involve emotional this standard cascade idea in this context. So it looks like this nonlinear wave dynamics is also the nonlinear vortex dynamics, whatever. But it's not quite coherent. No. Is it good notion here? Yeah, so I mean my model is quite a low resolution model. I'm kind of aiming for the kind of dynamics in these kind of lower resolution models. So we're not we're not resolving the turbulence. It's parameterized all through those parameterizations, which are quite rough. Um, so we don't have any of the right wave dynamics or anything. Um, and so you can see there's, there's some problems with these mixing schemes. In particular, so I think someone referred to it earlier. We know from observations in this region that we should have this state of marginal instability where the Richardson number sits about a quarter. You can see that in those simulations, that's not really happening. And that's because of these mixing schemes, which just aren't doing the right thing. Um, Yeah, so, I mean, I would say that that was their hypothesis. So when they first observed this, we th they thought, okay, maybe it's this extra meridional shear. Um, but they weren't really able to show that um, in the observations. And in particular, so I've, I've actually done some ca um, calculations with the tower ray data, and it seems to me that even in the, t in the tower ray data, we still see a large modulation in the equatorial under the zonal shear component. And so it seems like it's that's, that's mainly responsible for this, as opposed to the meridional shear, which is just quite a bit weaker than the zonal shear there. And so you get any variation in the zonal shear that'll be, play a larger role. <laughs>